nobody should be afraid to walk in their own, as their authentic selves, down their own street. Uh, and I believe in that better world, and I think most of us do as well. But we need to come together to make it happen, because that's what this dream of human rights really is all about. Hey there, and welcome back to Your Source, connecting you to the stories behind Canada's education ecosystem. My name is Wes Delve, Program Officer with the CTF FCA International and Social Justice Program, and it's my pleasure to bring you a new episode with trailblazing trans woman, queer advocate, and small business owner, Faye Johnstone. Faye is co-owner and executive director of Wisdom to Action, a national consulting firm specializing in community engagement, organizational development, and 2SLGBTQQIA inclusion. She is also president of the Society of Queer Momentum, a national 2SLGBTQQIA advocacy organization. And finally, she is also an outspoken activist. This episode discusses the harms of pronoun and chosen name policies in education across the country how to support 2SLGBTQQIA plus students and educators, the fight for inclusive curricula, the need for policy change at all levels of government, Faye's own experiences as a defender of trans and women's rights, and so much more. We hope you enjoy our conversation with Faye. Hello, Faye, and welcome to the podcast. It's great to reconnect with you today, as over the past couple of years, the CTF FCA has had the pleasure of working with Wisdom to Action on two initiatives, raising the bar for 2SLGBTQ plus youth and the resource toolkit on the conversion therapy ban. So to start us off, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and about the work of Wisdom to Action and Momentum Canada? Absolutely. And first, Wes, thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's always an honor to support the work of CTF. To introduce myself, my name is Faye Johnstone. I use she and they pronouns, and I am a trans woman living and working on unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin Anishinaabe territory, commonly known as Ottawa. I do a lot of queer and trans advocacy, both here locally in Ottawa and on the national level. I'm a writer, a organizer, and a consultant as well. I am connected to two organizations, those that you mentioned, so Wisdom to Action, a queer consulting firm and social enterprise that helps nonprofits, governments, and on occasion the private sector scale up their work, both within diversity, equity, and inclusion, and within community engagement and organizational development more broadly. On the other side, I'm the president of the Society of Queer Momentum, which is a new queer and trans advocacy organization challenging stagnating government leadership on queer and trans issues and working with communities to address the contemporary rise in anti 2 sli plus hate. Great. Well, thank you so much for your work, Faye, and also for taking the time to join us today to speak about a very important topic, a topic that has become very prominent over the past few months. We have all recently seen threats to the safety of 2SLGBTQIA plus staff and students in schools across Canada. For example, Policy 713 in New Brunswick, proposed changes to the Manitoba Public Schools Act, school pronoun policy in Saskatchewan and Ontario, and even more. So let's talk pronouns. In your estimation, in what ways could pronoun and chosen name policies in education across the country be harmful or dangerous? That's a great question. And what, what we are seeing across the country right now should be a source of deep concern for anyone passionate about children's education, uh, about school environments that help kids be their authentic selves, uh, and schools where we actually use evidence to inform policymaking rather than a bludgeon of a slogan. So over the past few years, we've seen the staggering rise in anti 2 sli plus hate all across Canada. And in the last three months, it's expressed itself in particular through this effort to roll back existing policies that protect the privacy and dignity of trans and gender diverse students. In particular, they've zeroed in on a trans student's right to use their chosen name and pronouns in the classroom. Now, what we know from the evidence is that trans students have a lot of mental health issues going on. They are more likely to be bullied. They're more likely to struggle. And unfortunately, a lot of these kids don't have safe homes to go back to. We need to make sure that we're doing all we can to keep those kids safe and to make sure parents are involved in these conversations. But what's happening right now is we're seeing governments, instead of dealing with the nuance of the issue, saying that we're actually going to stop kids from being able to come out at school on their own terms. 
And what that does to those kids is it tells them that they don't have the right to be themselves at school, that they don't have the respect of their teachers, of their administrators, of their parliamentarians to be who they know themselves to be. And so when you allow a kid an environment where they can figure out who they are, express themselves freely, uh, we know that that helps that kid thrive and grow into a successful and happy adult. When you deny those things, as we're seeing in New Brunswick and Saskatchewan, you contribute to a already difficult and hostile social environment. You send a signal to all the bullies that are already bullying these kids that, yeah, no, maybe that's not a wrong thing to do. And you're telling these kids that they don't get to be who they are. And imagine what message that sends uh, and what impact that has on their mental health, on their performance, on their ability and desire to show up at school. And so it really is about making sure that all kids, including queer and trans kids, are able to be themselves at school. And that's what these policies uh, that we've had for years are all about. And it's disappointing to see them politicized and attacked right now. That's excellent information. Thank you so much. So what exactly is the Facts Over Fear campaign and why was it launched? So a few moments ago, I mentioned this like bludgeon of a slogan. And that slogan has been echoed by far right groups Uh, And and those whose job is to launder hatred and bring it more into the public respectable sphere. Uh, And so it's this rhetoric around parental rights and this language around either gender ideology or grooming in the classroom. Uh, And I'm not going to say those terms again because they don't deserve more attention. They are just empty slogans uh, meant to generate fear. Um, But uh, what we've seen is as these far-right groups target trans and gender diverse kids, we need a better response. We need to show to Canadians, to parents, to young folks all across this country that there is a choice above and beyond accepting the disinformation that they are being targeted with right now. And so Facts Over Fear is our effort to clear the air, to get back to the basics, and that is creating schools where all kids are free to be their authentic selves. And I would argue that most Canadians, be you a newcomer, be you somebody from a low-wage job, be you a, a queer or trans person yourself, or a believer in a given faith, You believe that schools should be safe for all students to be themselves. And so the Facts Over Fear campaign is saying, we're going to set their vitriol and their slogan airing and their misinformation aside, and we're going to get back to making sure that all kids are safe in the classroom and able to thrive academically and personally in every aspect of their lives. Absolutely. So switching back to education, how can teachers and educators support 2SLGBTQQIA plus children and youth? I think we keep doing what our teachers and our education unions have been pushing for years. It is creating those spaces in the classroom where queer and trans students feel seen, where gender and sexuality isn't stigmatized, and where we recognize that all students benefit from understanding the social environment that we walk within as a society. Now, in some of these provinces, we are seeing the role of the teacher uh, politicized or restricted uh, by the government. So in New Brunswick, we've seen teachers being put in a position where government policy says one thing and their code of ethics, their moral obligations say something very different. And my message to those teachers is listen to your unions, uh, but also be ready to stand up for those queer and trans kids in the classroom. Because as governments play politics with these kids' identities, uh, those young folks are going to need a caring adult, a teacher who supports them, even if they know that their government and maybe even their own parents aren't going to back them up in that moment. Mm. Very good observations. Can you talk about the importance of fighting for inclusive and comprehensive curricula for 2SLGBTQIA plus children and youth? Absolutely. You know, we all get awkward during sex ed. That is a (laughs) given. Someone who used to do some sex education work, uh, we know that the world makes these topics hard to talk about. And that's why it's so important that we have education in our curricula, not just something a teacher desires to do, but that a teacher and a a classroom has to do uh, to make sure that we're touching on gender and sexuality. And that's both about curricula that talks about gender identity and sexual orientation, uh, but that's also about healthy uh, decision making, about sexual health, about consent and bodily autonomy. Uh, And these elements of curricula 
uh, they need to make sure that they're reaching all students. And we know that the sexual health needs of a queer or trans student might actually look a little bit different. And so that's why we need an education curricula uh, that both empowers students to make informed choices about their health and their bodies and who they are, and also provides that evidence-based education uh, so that when they encounter uh, critical moments, when they are considering getting into a relationship or struggling with their sexual orientation, they have that so- solid foundation of fact to make those decisions through. I really appreciate that you talk about evidence-based alternatives or choices when dealing with issues of curricula, et cetera, because when we base things in evidence, we have a lot more credibility to the, what we're trying to get accomplished. And that is just, I think, one of the most wonderful things that we can do. Now, as you know, the CTFFC is committed to ensuring publicly funded public education is welcoming and inclusive for all, and to having safe, gender-affirming schools and adequate resources for teachers. So what initiatives can individuals and organizations take on to support and to advocate for the safety and inclusion of 2SLGBTQQIA plus staff and students across Canada? I think there there are so many layers to this question, and I'm going to almost try to divide them. On one side, you have the work in a given school, right? So that's as a teacher or an educator, maybe supporting your school's GSA, participating in Rainbow Weeks, or making a note to remember the Trans Day of Remembrance or Trans Day of Visibility every year. So there's that work in the classroom. But then there's also that that work within your, your peer group. So helping educate other teachers, helping share these promising and best practices. And I know so many teachers are already doing that. And now I think is the time to even scale that up because we're seeing this politicization of our identities. I think as well that teachers can play a role in combating disinformation. One of the scary things that's happening here is that far-right groups are proliferating blatant lies and, and they're trying to get to parents, especially in our smaller towns and communities. What that means is you might have a parent come in asking about, to quote one of the worst disinformation tropes, like litter boxes in the classroom. And this idea that kids are identifying as furries and being given these litter boxes. This is a far-right hoax and has been disproven as such, but it still actually pops up sometimes, which shows you the power of disinformation. And so we need teachers who are equipped to manage those conversations and to bring some common sense and foundation back to it because parents are being lied to and they are having their own maybe lack of familiarity with trans people or lack of knowledge around gender and sexual education in the classroom weaponized as part of this far right movement. So I have my two pillars and I have my third. So the first one is keep doing what you do in the classroom. My second one is combat that disinfo and misinfo. And the third one really is alongside your unions, alongside your communities, we need to rally against the fear-based policies that are being pushed in different provinces. And so that's about getting involved with local queer and trans organizations. Uh, And I know we've seen that in both New Brunswick and Saskatchewan, where teachers and unions have tapped in. But we need to keep doing that work because what's under threat here, frankly, is not just inclusive schools for trans people, but it's a question of who we want to be as a society. Do we want to be a country that welcomes diversity and difference and allows folks to be who they are in all of the ways that might express itself, or do we want to allow the stigmatization of an already vulnerable community? Do we want to allow far-right groups to pit marginalized people against each other and to jeopardize our education through like culture war politics? I think we have the courage to choose the first and create schools where all kids can thrive. I couldn't agree more. You speak so eloquently about all of these matters and everything you say. It's, it's exactly what the people out there need to hear in the current climate. So speaking of policies that address safety and ultimately give students the freedom to be their authentic selves, in your estimation, what are some of the interventions or policy changes that are needed on the federal, provincial, territorial, perhaps even municipal levels to ensure the safety of all 2SLGBTQIA plus staff and students in our schools across Canada? I think that's a brilliant question. And I think on a local level, including both municipalities and school boards, and I guess on every level, we need to recognize that what happens in our schools is often an expression of broader social ideologies and social factors. 
But locally, I think what we can see would be school boards strengthening their local inclusion policies, making sure that they have plans in place to scale the capacity of educators and all those in a school uh, to provide inclusive and safe environments to trans and gender diverse students. That can include strengthening partnerships with local Planned Parenthoods or with local queer and trans organizations. Uh, so that if a kid is having a hard time, they have access to supports and to think through the parent involvement question, because we do need to make sure uh, that if a kid does come out and isn't ready to come out to their parents, but is out at school, that we have the mechanisms on a local level to help uh, strengthen that family relationship so that everyone is able to be on the same page and uh, and and supported uh, in their school and family context. So that's the, the local and municipal school board context. On a provincial level, I mean, A, uh, do the exact opposite of what Saskatchewan and New Brunswick are now trying to do, which is steamroll over nuanced policies that have had no indication of any issue within them. Uh, and instead of developing policies with the kind of care that a province should do, which is chat with parents, chat with students, maybe consult somebody who has a background in children's rights, So instead of doing any of the things that those two particular provinces are doing, what I would invite is for provincial ministries of education to actually put resources in place to support the professional development of teachers on queer and trans inclusion, to look at how they can address the whole continuum of needs that a young person might have so that, again, there's support for that parent who's having a hard time or for that teen who in a heartbreaking situation may have been kicked out of their house. And so ministries can set standards, they can fund uh, capacity development, they can help ensure those wraparound supports are available, and yes, they can actually review existing policies um, to make sure that they're strengthened, that they're nuanced, and that they address the needs of all students in an evidence-based manner. Federally, it becomes a whole other conversation. As we know, education is largely a provincial and school board level matter. Uh, But I think it is time for our federal government to recognize uh, that the hate that we're seeing right now is not an anomaly and is indeed an existential threat to our belief in human rights, inequality, and an inclusive Canada. And so my invitation federally is to ramp up and recognize that this hate isn't going anywhere, that it's not a coincidence, and we need partners across all of society if we're going to maintain our impression of ourselves as a country that is inclusive and actually, I think, proud to be inclusive of our track record on queer and trans people's human rights, inclusion, and overall equality. Those are are brilliant suggestions and really incredible calls to action. Thank you for sharing those. So we're going to switch the focus back to you. What does it mean for you to be a human rights defender and more specifically, a defender of trans rights? To me, it is a call to action, and I don't like the term duty to serve, but it's almost like I can't imagine we have so many crises going on in this world right now, and our trans kids and our trans communities are being attacked by political behemoths. And my community is still having a hard time. I'm still having a hard time navigating the hate that comes my way for doing this work. But I'm also in a position where I can, and there's an immense privilege to that. And so to me, there is a need for more voices out there. And it is really about recognizing that defending trans people's human rights and queer people's human rights is part of building that better future for everybody because no kid deserves to be kicked out of their home because they're trans. No person should live in poverty because they're queer and can't get a job. Nobody should be afraid to walk in their own, as their authentic selves, down their own street. Uh, And I believe in that better world. And I think most of us do as well. But we need to come together to make it happen because that's what this dream of human rights really is all about. Trans rights are human rights. And that's exactly it. So on the topic of being a defender of human rights, the CTFFCA is pleased to release new Speak Truth to Power lesson plans on youth defenders for human rights in Canada. And we also have a student voice booklet on affirming gender diversity. As you have mentioned, it's important to have resources in schools to support educators and educational settings to support people of all sexual orientations and gender identities. So that said, what additional resources or tools are you aware of that are available for educators? 
Uh, I mean, there was this wonderful product that we pulled together with CTF, um, raising the bar on 2SL2I two plus inclusion. I would encourage folks to take a peek at that. Um, I would also encourage folks uh, to do some looking into like disinformation and misinformation. I would say that there are a few organizations working in that space, including the Canadian Anti-Hate Network. But I know that there is more being developed. So take a little bit of time and try to do more than read the headlines on some of the misinformation and disinformation out there, because it's not enough to say we're not grooming kids because they're going to spin that and they're already captured by misinfo and conspiracy. We need to think through response that brings some care and that help folks invite a conversation to really unpack what people's worries, anxieties, and needs are. And so that's not a resource. Uh, maybe I'm really big on my calls to action. Maybe it's more of that. Uh, but it really is just equipping ourselves to step into these convos because one of the best ways that we meet this moment when we're facing a political behemoth and disinformation is to chat with one another and get back to what's really going on and common sense in the classroom and policies that let all kids thrive. We need to get that message out there and that would be one of the biggest wins we could get right now. Concentrating on the facts instead of the fear. Facts over fear. And Absolutely. again, recognizing like teachers, young people, families, we're all trying to achieve the same thing. And there isn't some conspiracy underpinning this. It is really about nuanced evidence-based policies that are customized to the needs of a given young person and implemented through the brilliant teachers that we have in our classrooms all across this country. <laughs> The way you speak makes me so happy because these are exactly the messages that the people out there need to hear. So I want to thank you for sharing those ideas and we'll be sure to include any appropriate links to what you've suggested in the description for this particular episode. So before we wrap up, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Any final thoughts that I might not have asked you about? I think what I would say is there's a lot of fear and hurt out there right now. And I think that makes sense. People are scared. We are worried around this like culture war crisis that seems to be upon us. And a lot of folks are worried about how far this can go. How far could we roll back? How much scarier could we get? And it's good to be a little bit worried about that. I'm not minimizing the fear by any means. But on the flip side, I think that the far right wants us to be scared. They want us to be demoralized because that makes us demotivated. And at the end of the day, I know that we will win. And I want everyone to hear that with me because it's easy to lose sight. We have come so far on queer and trans rights in 20 years. Imagine how much further we will be in 20 more. And so I am going to be singing and celebrating and dancing my way to that better tomorrow because I know that we will win. I know that we will meet this moment. And while it's scary out there, I know that we're not alone in this fight because our allies, our parents, our teachers, our young people, and people all around this country will come together in the belief that we all deserve the space to be our free and authentic selves. I love it. I love it. I'd really like to thank you, Faye, not just for being with us today for this podcast, but more importantly, for your bravery, your dedication, your passion and your energy and your leadership where trans and women's rights are concerned. Here at the CTFFCO, we are honored to count you among our youth defenders for human rights in Canada. And we are also very proud to be accompanying you, albeit in some small way, on your very courageous journey. So thank you. Thank you for everything. Thanks so much, Wes. It's always a pleasure. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in for this conversation. Onwards and upwards, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this episode with Faye Johnstone. To learn more, be sure to check out the show notes for links to Momentum Canada's Facts Over Fear campaign, the new Faye Johnstone Gender Diversity Lesson Plan from the Speak Truth to Power Youth Defenders for Human Rights in Canada series, the CTF FCA's Affirming Gender Diversity Student Voice Booklet, and Wisdom to Actions Raising the Bar for 2SLGBTQ Plus Youth Resources. Thank you for tuning in to your source.